There's a curious law in Leviticus. It seems like a very small thing, something unlikely to ever occur. And then you wonder in the economy of the Bible, since there aren't that many, much space for that many words, why is it even in there? It's found in Leviticus 19.14, it's just one verse, and it says this, You shall not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but shall fear your God. I am the Lord. Now, the first of these particular crimes seems really utterly harmless. You can't possibly hurt a deaf person's feeling by cursing him behind his back. You know, to curse someone who can't hear the curse, I mean, how could it possibly hurt his feelings? He's going to, he doesn't care what you have said. Now, the latter, a stumbling block before the blind, that has the potential for hurting somebody a little bit. But who would ever do such a thing? I mean, I was a mischievous little kid. But it would never have occurred to me to put a stumbling block in front of a blind person. I would have felt sorry for a blind person, would never have done that. Now, the person who cannot see beyond the letter of the law will never understand this passage of Scripture, never really have occasion much to apply it in his life in a meaningful way. But there's something you need to understand. I want, in order to make you understand it, I need to draw a comparison with another law, one that is interpreted in the New Testament. It's the Apostle Paul. And the law is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 9. Paul says, For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treads out the corn. Simple law. Easy to understand. you got an ox going around in circles of treading out threshing corn. Don't muzzle the ox. Let him eat a little bit as he goes. Then Paul says something really quite astonishing. He says, Does God take care for oxen? The implication is, no, he doesn't. Doesn't he say this for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written that he that plows should plow in hope, he that threshes should in, uh, in, in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we then have sown to you in spiritual things, is it a great thing if we would reap your carnal things? Paul is making a point as he goes along here that actually it's okay for people to be paid who actually serve in the gospel full-time as a part of their life, or even part-time. It is permissible for them to achieve some part of their living from the carrying out of the gospel. That is his point. The law is not about oxen. It's about an underlying principle. Now, one of the things that I think people often do not understand when they read the Old Testament is they don't understand that the point of the law is for you to study it, to meditate on it, and to try to come to understand the ways in which the law might be applied in your life, right here, right now. A totally different kettle of fish. I don't have to worry about muzzling the ox that treads out the corn. I don't have an ox. I got a dog. And my dog, you know, doesn't produce anything that she could eat a part of. I'll tell you that for sure. <laughs> now, the same thing is true concerning the Levitical law. I, I cited about people, about deaf people, and about blind people. And this is going to require some explanation so you can understand what it is I'm driving at. One day, I was driving uh, on a Sunday morning with a friend, and we happened to pass by a church at the time when people were going in for the morning service. Don't remember what kind of church it was. It was a Norman Rockwell kind of a church, you know, beautiful, standard-looking church, steeple, nice-looking, well-groomed, a lot of nice-looking, well-groomed people going in wearing their Sunday best, and mom and dad and little kids going along and Bibles under arms and everybody all scrubbed up for church on Sunday morning. It would have made a Norman Rockwell painting. My friend observed the scene and he said, look at all those pagans going in there to worship Nimrod. Now those were precisely his words. I'll never forget them until my dying day. Those were precisely his words and he meant it. Actually meant it. He wasn't being funny about it. He also believed though that these people were deceived that God had never opened their ears to understand the truth, that they really were doing the best they knew how, he would have had to have admitted that these people couldn't understand or couldn't do different if you told them. That would have been his belief. So what he did on this fine Sunday morning was to curse the deaf. They couldn't hear him. We were driving by in a car, so it wouldn't have mattered to them. But even if they had heard him by his lights, it wouldn't have mattered because they couldn't have done much of anything different from what they were doing. So what is the point in criticizing or demonizing or cursing people who couldn't hear? If they could hear, it wouldn't matter and couldn't and don't hear you anyway because you're driving by in a car. 
Now, I meant this by his own standards. As I said, these people were deaf to the truth. So why despise them for following their best lights? The gentleman, by the way, was hardly alone in expressing these sentiments in his church, in the church that I attended to at that time. A lot of people felt precisely the same way. But really, what he was doing was harmless, wasn't it? Because the people could not hear what he said. He could not have hurt them, could not have hurt their feelings in any way. It was just two guys passing in the car, one of them talking to the other. That's true. He couldn't hurt their feelings. But then we have to ask the question, why the commandment? Thou shalt not curse the deaf. What's it in there for if it doesn't matter when you do that kind of thing? I'm going to tell you why. The deaf cannot hear your words, but he can read your spirit. Your body language, your facial expression, your approach, your heart, your attitude will come through regardless of what you can do. You cannot hide a contemptuous spirit. Sooner or later, people will discern it, and it will turn them away from you and away from whatever wonderful truth you may have in hand that you otherwise might be able to give them. If you are critical of people, they will sense it. They may not know what it is they sense. They may not know where it's coming from. They may not know how, you know, from any words that you have ever said. All they will know is, that you either don't like them, or you don't care about them, or that you think you're better than they are, they won't know. They will only be vaguely aware of an antipathy, an aversion, uh, some barrier that exists between you and them, and they will not know why and will be utterly unable to understand it. So, don't curse the deaf, because it will show in other aspects of your life. There's a, there's a little shortman in, in Ecclesiastes it says, curse not the king. No, not in your thought. Don't curse the king in your thought. Now, that's really fascinating because he then says, for a little bird of the air will carry the voice and that which has wings will tell the matter. You have any idea of who that little bird is that will carry your thought to the king or the words you speak in your bedchamber to the rich? that you contemptuously speak of? It's you. It's your face. It's your posture. It's your body language. Your approach. Your standoffishness. Your aloofness. Whatever aspect of it is in you, but it will always find a way of breaking through your reserve and somebody, whoever it is that you hold in contempt, will know that you do, even though they may not even be able to to express what it is or understand it that way. Try to take the gospel to someone whom you have criticized, somebody you have demonized, somebody you have condemned, and they are just not going to be interested in hearing it from you. Why? Because they don't feel that you care about them. They sense that somehow or other you may not like them. They sense that there's something's not quite right about you. And therefore, your efforts to proclaim the gospel will fall flatter than yesterday's pancake. They will know your heart is not right to with them. Therefore, thou shalt not curse the death, the deaf. Now, I don't know if you realize it yet or recognize what I'm saying to you, but I have identified what may be the greatest barrier the church, any church, has ever erected to reaching the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is that tendency to curse the deaf, that tendency to treat with contempt or look upon with contempt people who don't think the way you do and don't see what you do, and in some cases can't see what you do. How could people be attracted to a church full of people who don't like them? How could people be attracted to the gospel of a preacher who talks down to them? And if this is something, and this is something you can't fake, by the way. You can't pretend this. You can't put it on. If you hold people in contempt for their beliefs and their practices, they will be repelled from you. And you will have zero chance of being able to convey the gospel to them in a meaningful way at all. And this will happen in your relations with the public, your coworkers, 
your family, your wife or husband, or your friends. That people that you otherwise would have a good relationship to will be alienated from you once you start talking about your religion and your faith because of your contempt for their religion and for their faith, which though you don't speak of it, you cannot hide. It just is the way it is. Now, there is a parable of Jesus that is too familiar here for me to have any need to read it to you. It's the parable of the Pharisee and the publican, which all of us could almost cite by memory. We've heard it so many times in sermon. But what does bear emphasizing is the reason why Jesus spoke this parable at that time. You'll find the reference, just one verse, Luke 18, verse 9. He spoke this parable unto certain who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Now, I grew up using the word despise as a synonym for hate, and that's not really quite right. The word despise, as it's used in the King James Bible, basically means to look upon with contempt. It means to hold somebody in a, a level of contempt or to look down upon people in a most contemptuous way. It was a Pharisee who had this attitude. But I'm here to tell you the same attitude, same spirit is alive and well among many, many people who claim to be Christians, who trust in themselves that they are righteous, who look down on fellow Christians, who do not see the gospel as they see it. It's precisely the same spirit that the Pharisee brought into the temple when he said, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, looked down his nose and despised this, this man who was standing opposite him in the temple. When my friend said that these people were going into, into that church on that day to worship Nimrod, do you know what he was talking about? Do you have any idea where this idea came from ultimately? Well, it's based upon a misinterpretation of Deuteronomy chapter 12 and verse 29 and the verses following it. And I think it might be worth taking just a moment to look at what these verses say. In verse 12 of Deuteronomy 29, God says, When the Lord your God shall cut off all the nations from before you, where you go in to possess them, and you succeed them and you dwell in their land. Pay attention to yourself I don't want you to be snared by following them after they are destroyed, and that you inquire not after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? I'll do likewise. You shall not do so unto the Lord your God. Now the warning and the prohibition here is don't take the practices that these people use and use these practices to worship me. I'm not going to have any of that. Don't want it not to take place. For every abomination of the Lord which he hates they have done to their gods, even their sons and their daughters they have burnt in a fire to their gods. Now whatever thing I command you, you observe to do that, you don't add anything to it, you don't take anything away from it. Now we all understand that. But we also think, I think it's fair to say though, that many Christian churches have allowed some pagan customs to become a part of their worship of God. There's no arguing with this, that they have allowed certain aspects that can be traced directly back to the worship of other gods, they have allowed to creep into Christian culture and Christian worship. They should not have done that, and God will judge them for it. But some, like my friend I mentioned earlier, allow that in allowing pagan customs into church, that they have ceased to worship the God of the Bible and Jesus Christ and have turned to worshiping Baal. I don't think so. I think the warning in Deuteronomy is, is to not to attempt to worship the true God with the customs that they may have borrowed from pagan religion. It is not a question yet, although many of them did turn to worshiping Baal and other gods, it's not a question yet of worshiping another God. It is a question of the methodology for worshiping the true God, and they began to do it wrong. The people that were going into that church were, by our lights at the time, or by our lights even today, mistaken in their belief. But the scriptures they read and read are the Bible. The songs they sing in praise of God are sung to the God of the Bible. The Jesus they study about is the Jesus of the Bible. How do I know that? Well, because I went to one of those churches for most of my life. I mean, for many years of my life, up until I was, uh, you know, in my 20s. Went to one of those churches regularly, and I know, I know when I went to the church what I had in my mind. I know who I was worshiping. I knew who I was singing those songs to. It was the Jesus of the Bible, of the New Testament. It was the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. It wasn't somebody else. I was mistaken. 
I didn't understand. I was in error. And I have very little doubt that some parts of my worship of God were in vain. But I also am convinced that some of my worship of God and some of my prayers were heard by him in that time of my life. I am fully persuaded of that. Now, these people, however much we may disagree with them, who attend this or that church and maybe have allowed certain customs, which we would not approve of, to enter into their church, however much we may do that, these people are not people whom the New Testament writers would call unbelievers. They would not refer to them that way. Now, if there's a, a scripture back in 2 Corinthians that is sometimes looked at in this regard, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14. And I remember hearing this many, many years ago before I ever heard of the church of God mentioned in, a, in this context. Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion has light with darkness? And the admonition was, don't go marrying somebody of another faith. You're becoming unequally yoked together with an unbeliever and all of the possible difficulties that might arise out of that. Well, now, I would agree that marrying someone of another faith is going to be problematic. I don't have any question that that might be true. And a couple that are going to be thinking about getting married and they're not in the same church, they probably ought to have some, a lot of long, hard talks about it and be sure they understand each other thoroughly before they ever go that direction. But that's not what this scripture is about. When Paul wrote this particular scripture, there were unbelievers by the, by the jillions all over the streets where they actually were. In Corinth, all you had to do was walk down the street to find a temple with real idols that were indisputably other gods like Apollo, Diana, uh, Mars, Mercury. They were all right there. Just walk down the street, walk into them, and you're in a pagan temple. A real pagan temple were right there. And so when Paul says, don't become unequally yoked together with unbelievers, he is not talking about somebody who believes in Christ but believes in Christ differently from what you believe. He's talking about people who don't believe in Christ at all in any shape, form, or fashion. Also, there were Jews who were abject unbelievers in Jesus, believed in the same God, but didn't believe in Jesus at all. Then he asked this question, what concord has Christ with Belial? What part has he that believes with an infidel? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? And like I said, there were real idols there, not just idols in people's minds, there were real idols on the street corners that you could actually see walking by them. Paul passed one little altar that says to the unknown God and made a whole sermon around it. You are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be you separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. I'll be a father to you. You shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord God Almighty. Who's he talking about? coming out from among them. Good grief, we're in Corinth, people. To Corinthianize was a, was, a, was a term in the ancient world, a euphemism for to fornicate and do every other kind of evil sin. Corinthians was a freewheeling, wild town to be in. Las Vegas looks tame compared to Corinthians, to Corinth at that time. When he says, come out from among her people, he's talking about real idols, real corruption. I mean, fornication taking place right in the temple of one of these idol gods. This is the kind of thing that Paul is dealing with when he talks about unbelievers. Now, in the Bible, what's the difference between a believer and an unbeliever? Not what you and I think about today, but in the Bible, what is the difference? Early in Jesus' ministry, while he was at Jerusalem, he had done a lot of miracles, and everybody was stunned by what he was doing. You'll find this short little passage in John chapter 2. Verse 23, when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and needed not that any man should testify. Nobody needed to tell him about man because he knew about man. Now what we see from this passage, a couple of things. One of them is that as a result of what Jesus was doing, an awful lot of people were believing in him. But their belief must have been pretty superficial. They saw a miracle and who would not be impressed? You see a blind man who can see, a lame man who can walk, and you see Jesus laying hands on people and healing them, you're going to believe something. But Jesus had to realize that even though they believed on him, that he could not at this point put any trust in them because their goodness, their, their, their belief could be here today and gone tomorrow. But they are called believers in Jesus. 
Mind you, you could not call these people unbelievers because they really did believe. Later, Jesus is in Samaria. You'll find this in John 4. He's in Samaria. He stopped by the, at the well and asked the woman of Samaria to draw water for him. And they have the interchange that they have there, which is fascinating in all of itself. But it says in verse 39, Many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, He told me all I ever did. They believed him on the basis of her word. So when the Samaritans were come to him, they besought him that he would tarry with them. He stayed there many days. I mean, sorry, sorry, he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. So they listened to Jesus. Jesus taught one little miracle. And they were believing on him in their dozens, perhaps in their hundreds, in Samaria at this time. Everywhere Jesus went, he was creating believers, 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 everywhere along the way that he went. Later in Capernaum, John chapter 6, verse 51, he's in a synagogue in Capernaum. And he says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And the Jews in the synagogue began to argue among themselves. And they said, how can he give us his flesh to eat? They were taking Jesus literally. And they were not trying to understand in any depth what it was he was saying. Then Jesus said, unless I, I tell you the truth, except you eat the flesh of the, Son of, God, of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. John is here taking Jesus' words to develop the underlying theme of the Passover of the Lord's Supper. Verse 59. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying who can hear it? And the sense in which they are asking this question is, who can accept it? They were saying, this is a hard saying. I just can't accept what he is saying. Who? Disciples of Jesus were saying this. And when Jesus knew that his disciples were murmuring about it, he said, does this offend you? What are you going to think when you see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It's the spirit that, qu that, that, pro that quickens the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you, their spirit and their life. Then he said this, but there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who it was who didn't believe and who would betray him. Who's he saying this to? He's not merely saying this to what you would call believers. He's saying it to what you would call disciples. Now, this is important. There were unbelievers even among the apparent disciples of Jesus. Just as there were believers to whom Jesus would not be willing to commit himself. So that you have all this development of people through their Christian stages who come to a certain point, back off. Come to it again, perhaps, back off. Jesus said to them, I say unto you, no man can come to me except it were given to him of my Father. And from that time, Many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. You know, the very first stage in the life of a Christian is that of a believer. We believe Jesus. That's step number one. The next stage requires a little bit of commitment because you become a disciple. A disciple means a learner, a follower of Jesus, someone who actually makes a decision to walk along the way and to do the things that Jesus is saying you should do. And even at this later stage, the hold on the Christian faith can be tenuous because some of his disciples turned around, walked away. So the concept of being a believer or being a disciple, of being someone who is just maybe interested as a believer or someone who has even made a commitment as a disciple, even here we do not have an absolute you know, distinction that might be made between people who believe and people who don't. <clears throat> Still later. In Jerusalem, John 7. Then Jesus cried in the temple and, and, and taught, saying, You both know me, and you know whence I came from, but I am not come of myself, but he that sent me uh, is true, whom you don't know. I know him, for I am from him, and he has sent me. Then they sought to take him, but nobody laid hands on him, because his hour was not yet come. And many of the people believed on him, and they said, When Christ comes, will he do more miracles than this man has done? Now, that reveals to us that what they were believing was that he was the Christ. 
They believed on Jesus. They believed he is the Christ because when the Christ comes, will he do more miracles than Jesus has done? The answer is obviously no. And so they believed on, on Jesus on this occasion. In the very next chapter, John chapter 8, verse 28, Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you shall know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as the Father has taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. As he spoke these words, many believed on him. Not just, he wasn't doing a miracle at this point. He was just teaching. And as he spoke the words, people believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews who believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. Interesting, the, the, the way in which this is worded. You believe. If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples. And he uses the word indeed, implying there was a way to be a disciple, but not indeed. There was a sort of an almost disciple, a, a sort of pseudo disciple, a disciple not quite, if you will. But what these guys are going to be, if they continue in his word, disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he really created a following. And I can only, you know, you can hardly imagine the effect that, that must have had. That man was in that grave three, four days, and Jesus comes, he walks out of there, and they untie him and let him loose. Actually, you'll find it in John 11, verse 43. When he spoke about these things, he, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. He probably could hardly move. Jesus said, loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. And why not? I mean, I believe on him too. I see a dead man come back to life. However, some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told him what Jesus had done. Then gathered the chief priests and Pharisees a council and said, what are we going to do? This man does many miracles. If we let him alone like this, all men will believe on him and the Romans will come and take away our place and nation. Belief in Jesus was growing like wildfire. It was an epidemic in the nation at that time. Chapter 12, verse 10, But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus to death also, because by reason of him, many Jews went away from them and began to believe in Jesus. It was an epidemic, and it was getting out of hand. Then there's this sad note. In John 12, verse 42, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers, also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. And you know, you can only conclude from this that believing in Jesus was a very complicated thing in the minds of the people who did. People believed at different levels. They believed in different degrees. They believed to certain levels of commitment. They, they came to certain levels of commitment and they backed away from these levels of commitment. It just is they had their ups and downs. And you have to realize this. After the crucifixion of Jesus and his resurrection, which the word of it had been not spread that far, when the disciples came together, there were only 120 disciples left, and I always find that completely fascinating. After all those, number, all those people believed on him, I mean, thousands of people had believed on Jesus by this time, 120 disciples are left at this late time. Jesus had died. He had been raised. Many of them had not heard of it, and probably some of those who had heard of it didn't believe it. And frankly, you might not have either. I'm sure that many who believed in Jesus did not believe in his resurrection. And then came the day of Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit was poured out, sermon was preached, and on that day they baptized 3,000 people. I want to tell you something. I really doubt that all those 3,000 people, or even most of them, came to baptism that day from a standing start. These were probably people who had come to believe in Jesus long before that. I would say the vast majority of those 3,000 people had seen Jesus in his ministry. They had probably seen somebody healed. 
They had heard Jesus preach a sermon. They had heard him teach. They didn't come completely blank. They had believed him. They just hadn't been able to believe all the way. They had believed him. They just hadn't been able to commit. They believed, but they needed God to help their unbelief. Like the poor guy who came asking him to heal his daughter. <coughs> daughter, I believe it was. And he says, if you believe, you can. He says, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. And candidly, I think most of us understand that. We understand that right down to the core of our being. And we believe. And we just need help with some of the areas where we have a little difficulty in believing. So we have some important distinctions to make. There are people who pretend to believe and don't. They are, aren't that hard to discern, but sometimes it takes some time and some trials and something has to come along before you ever really know that. And so consequently, you can look around your church and you can think, well, we're all the insiders. We are the believers. We are the people of faith. We are the people who are committed to Christ, the disciples, and so forth. Yes and no. Some of us are and some of us aren't. Some of us believe, some of us don't. And then there are people who believe, but who don't follow with us. Now that's an interesting concept. And you find it really expressed in Mark chapter 9, verse 38. This is a kind of an unusual circumstance that developed as these guys had been out doing their, their work for Jesus and very excited by it. And in Mark 9, verse 38, John answered Jesus and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in your name, and he doesn't follow us, so we forbade him, because he doesn't follow us. And Jesus said, Forbid him not. There is no man who shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. He that is not against us is on our part. Now you have to conclude that poor guy over there who was casting out those demons was a believer, wouldn't you? You'd have to conclude he believed in Jesus' name, for he was able. There were people, by the way, who tried to cast out demons in Jesus' name who got themselves in a whole lot of trouble, beaten to an inch, inch of their life by the man in whom the demon was on one occasion. But this fellow was doing it. He was stepping up and saying, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of the man. And the demon was leaving the man. And here they are saying, well, we told him don't do that. Why? Because he doesn't follow us. He's not in the in group. And this is a very serious mistake. Here is a, group, a, a, a word of caution on this. There was another day when Jesus had been casting out demons and, 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 and it was getting to be a problem for the Pharisees because everybody was talking about it. And they had to find a way to explain what was going on. And so in Matthew 12, 34, they said this. When the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the prince of of demons. Now you realize what they had just done? They had at this point in time attributed the power of God, a work of the power of God to the devil. Simple and clear. Jesus knew their thoughts. He said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. Every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. In verse 30, he that is not with me is against me. You kind of hear echoes of this in George Bush's speeches, but then he is a reader of the Bible. He who is not with me is against me. He that gathers not with me scatters abroad. Therefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven unto men. Now it's widely understood that Jesus is saying here that to attribute the works of the Holy Spirit to the devil is unpardonable. I take that to be a serious warning about speaking evil of people who believe in Jesus and who do good works in his name, however misguided those people may be. And they're out there. They're out there in their hundreds and in their thousands doing good works in the name of Jesus. Now, they're going to have to answer to him one of these days about some of the things they didn't do. They're going to say, we, 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 know, we, we did all these wonderful works in your name, and Jesus is going to say, I don't know you. But that's not our problem. Our question is, are we going to attribute works done in Jesus' name by people who say they're worshiping Christ, are we going to attribute those to the devil? Or might we not be in danger of doing the same stupid thing that John did, saying, we told him stop that because he isn't following us. I take it as a serious warning. You shall not curse the deaf.
If they're deaf, if they don't know any better, it's not our business to run them down. It's not our business to criticize their works. And if they're doing good works in the name of Jesus Christ, more power to them. I have no criticism to offer of them. And there are some other interesting references in the book of Acts. Acts 8 and verse 12. This is a really interesting one because this is when Philip went up to Samaria and preached the gospel up there. And somebody had been up there ahead of him who really, really had bewitched all the people. His name was Simon the Magician. Well, when the people of Samaria believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. And Simon himself, Simon the magician, believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs that were done. And he offered them money and tried to buy office in the church. And his name passes down through history to the practice of simony. He believed. He was baptized. Here's a man who was a part of the in-group, part of the church, baptized, who believed, but his level of commitment, his heart, was not right. And of course, because of what he did, Peter was able to know immediately where his spirit and where his attitude was. In Acts 11, verse 20, you have the really interesting story of the birth of the Antioch church. Some of the men who were of Cyprus and Cyrene, who had been converted in Jerusalem, were come to Antioch, and they spoke to the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Here's the same term, they believed God. But these people went on and established the church in Antioch, which formed the basis of all the work that Paul began to do. This was his launching point. These were the people that supported him. These were the ones that sent him out and prayed for him out of the church in Antioch. It really is something to behold how that the work goes, the initial stage, people believe. That's where it all starts. Acts 15 is a really interesting case in point. Because here is the occasion where Paul comes back from his journey. He and Barnabas are absolutely floating. They're so high from all that's happened. And all the Gentiles who have turned to God and believed God and been baptized and have received the Holy Spirit, sometimes with outward signs of receiving the Holy Spirit. And they know where they are. And here come some people up from Jerusalem saying, oh no, 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 this can't be. You have to baptize these people. I mean, you, you have to circumcise these people before you baptize them. And it's described in this way in Acts 15, verse 5. There arose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees who believed. The sect of the Pharisees who believed, saying it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses, and the implication is to be saved. Now, what's my point in all of this? My point is there is a wide range of people in the Bible called believers. But in the parable, sorry, in, the, in the, this, the parable of the Pharisee and the publican, the publican is said to have despised others. And this is what brings me finally, not finally, but almost finally, to Romans 14. Romans chapter 14. Roman, in Romans 14, Paul says this, him that is weak in the faith, receive you, but not to doubtful disputations, not for arguments, not for bickering. You are to accept him as your brother in full. Even though he's weak in the faith, and there are a lot of stuff that he doesn't understand yet. Okay? One believes he may eat anything. Another who is weak eats herbs. Let not him that eats despise him that eats not. Let not him that eats not judge him that eats. God has received him. Here's the word. Despise. The publican looked down his nose and despised the, the public. Sorry, the, the Pharisee despised the publican in prayer in the temple. Now he says, you be very careful that you don't look down your nose at your brother and despise him that doesn't eat. Let him that eats, if you're not going to eat, don't judge him that eats. God has received him. There is that word that Jesus used to describe the Pharisee, despised. Who are you that judges another man's servant? And this past, this little short statement should ring in our ears from time to time. You know, Paul says it. Who are you? Who are you to judge another man's servant? To his own master he, shall, he stands or fall. Yea, he shall be held up for God is able to make him stand. You may think he's weak. You may think he's falling on his face and left himself, he might. But God's able where you're not. Therefore, you got no business putting this poor guy down. 
You got no business treating him with contempt. You have no business cursing him even in your heart. You have no business criticizing him in your bedchamber. Because if you do that, you, you, you actually allow yourself to do that, he'll know. He'll know. May not know in detail, but he will know in spirit, and it will hurt the person in question and you as well. Who are you that judges another man's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. He'll be held up. God is able to make him stand up. Do you suppose that the self-righteous in our own church might not even listen to this concerning other churches? Other churches. Who are you who judges another man's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. In fact, God is able to make him stand. God is sovereign. God has the power. God can actually take this in places you would never imagine that it would otherwise go. Remember what happened on Pentecost? 3,000 people were baptized. Among them might well have been some of those disciples of Jesus who turned back and wouldn't continue walking with them. Among them were many people who believed but couldn't make the commitment at that time. There, is, there are people who make these, state, these commitments, take these little baby steps as they make their way into the church of God or into the kingdom of God, and they go, come along at the speed God brings them, and through whatever path God brings them, God is able. Who are we that judge as another man's servant? Who are we to judge a, a Methodist, a Protestant, a, Bath, a Baptist, a Catholic? Are people who believe in Jesus, but at the same time are mistaken, or don't understand something, or are making mistakes, or committing sins. Just like, sounds a lot like us, doesn't it? Mistaken, confused from time to time, committing sins, falling down, letting down, just like me. One man esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in whose mind? His own mind. After all, he that regards the day regards it too, the Lord. He that regards not the day, to the Lord he does not regard it. He that eats, eats to the Lord. For he gives God thanks. He that eats not to the Lord, he eats not, and gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. Whether we live, we live to the Lord. Whether we die, we die to the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. You don't belong to me, I don't belong to you. And the one that's going to have to make each of us stand is God. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be the Lord both of the dead and of the living. But why, Paul says, do you judge your brother? And why do you, and the King James Version says, set at naught your brother, but the word is the same. Why do you despise your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Responsive reading, folks. We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me. Every tongue shall confess to... Don't be bashful. Every tongue shall confess to God. Not you, not me, not the church, God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to... Okay, now I think we all understand that, don't we? Where the accountability lies. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore. Judge this rather, and here we are. Let no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. He shall not curse the death nor put a stumbling block in the way of the blind. How simple, how clean, how easy it is to understand. The thing you got to understand later in verse chapter 15, verse 1, he says, We then who are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. But let each one of us please his neighbor for his good, for edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, as it is written, The reproaches of them that reproached you fell on me. What we are talking about is a matter of the attitude of mind and of heart. I think it's time for us to face up to some important truths in the church of God. One, that our country is full of believers in Christ. They're all over the place, all over the landscape. Those who believe in Jesus, whatever their errors and whatever are their mistakes, are not our enemies. They are our brothers and they share a like precious faith. 
Some of you remember when we rented that little Baptist church over on, uh, Troop, on, on the uh, Troop Highway. And I made the statement, I think the first time we were there, we rented their fellowship hall and met there. I said that we have more in common in our beliefs in God with these people than we have different by far. We forget that far too easily. They do not have some important truths. They do not bear the sign of the Sabbath. They do not bear the holy days. But that does not mean they will not believe those things tomorrow or the day after tomorrow or a year from now or 15 months, whenever it takes, whenever God is ready and God brings. It doesn't mean they're not going to come to these things. Just as in the days when Jesus walked the earth, there are believers at every imaginable stage of development in their spiritual lives. Every imaginable stage. And, and it's not a one-way street. They go forward, they fall back. They come again, they try it again, they fall back again. They come and they go. But God ultimately will do and will make them to stand. There, then in that time, there were people who kept the Sabbath, the holy days, the dietary laws, the tithing laws, and all that stuff that we think is very important. In fact, we believe and know it's very important. And of whom Jesus said in those days that they were hypocrites, vipers, snakes in the grass, children of hell, blind guides, fools, and whited sepulchers. That's what he had to say about people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous, who had the Sabbath, holy days, tithing, clean and unclean meats, take them off. All these unique and special doctrines that we hold and cherish, what did it buy them? Where did it take them? To belief in God? Snakes in the grass, hypocrites, vipers, children of hell. Today, there are those of us who trust in the very doctrines that the Pharisees carefully observe, and we think they're going to set us apart from the great unwashed body of Christianity out there. How far did it carry the Pharisees? Not realizing we also can be hypocrites. We also can be blind guides. Not realizing we can hinder the gospel while we curse the deaf and cast a stumbling block before the feet of the blind. Not realizing that meekness is a fundamental value for a witness of God. Simple meekness. Paul wrote to Titus, and this is one of the most powerful statements I've ever read on this subject. He wrote to Titus beginning in chapter 2, verse 15. He said, These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise you. So here it comes, the rebuke with all authority. Put these people in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. And here it is. Are you ready for it? To speak evil of no man. Where are you going to make exceptions to that? I mean, that's pretty comprehensive. To speak evil of no man. To be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. And here is the fundamental value for anyone who is going to carry the gospel to anyone in the world. Gentle meekness to all men and speaking evil of no one. Why? For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. We also, we were like that. We were not very good people. But after that, the kindness of love of, of, and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, which one of us, by our works of righteousness, got all our lives straightened out that we were able on our own, by our own hook, to get all that behind us and change it? We didn't do that. It was his mercy that saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And considering who we used to be, and considering how we got to be made anything different from that, who in the world do we think we are to look down our nose at another human being anywhere on this earth? We have no business cursing the deaf. We should be more sparing of our condemnation in order that we might be the sons of God. Finally, John 3, 16, a very old standby. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And listen to this. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, 
but that the world through him might be saved. We should be sparing of our condemnation that we might be the sons of God.